Thank you, uh, worship team, for uh, leading us there to the throne. Uh, Man, what a powerful name of Jesus. We're in week three of this series called Back to the Future. Um, and uh, I have no gimmicks, no pictures, no nothing. I just want to get into it today. Um, and uh, with it, uh, if you're with us the first week, uh, uh, Pastor Sean did an amazing job setting us up as Jesus as this king, like he is our king. Last week we talked about Jesus as, and looked at him as, as righteous. We said that righteousness isn't behavior modification but a heart transformation. And the only way we can have that heart transformation is because of what Jesus did. And every week we're going to have probably the same theme over and over again. Looking at the cross, looking at the resurrection because that's what Jesus did for us. Here's what I want you to walk away from today. Christ's victory assures our victory. What Christ did for us, Christ's victory assures our victory. Do this. What do you think of when you hear the word victory? What is it that comes to mind when you hear the word victory? When you think of victory, is it, is it your favorite sports team? It's not a high state. They got beat by number 15 seed in the, in the tournament. Like, I'll take it. I'll take it. That's all right. All right? I get it. So, yeah, we'll stick to football. Yeah, I know. I know. It's been rough, right? But what is it when you think of victory? Is it, is it your sports team? Uh, maybe it's your spouse actually picking the place they want to eat for dinner for the first time ever. What is victory to you? What is it that comes to mind? Maybe it's a movie. Maybe it's that, that, like like when I was writing this, I started thinking of some of those, like, like what I call classic movies, like Gladiator. Like, just, I call them, like, manly man, like, death, destruction, like, victory or Braveheart. What is it when you think of victory? Well, I'm sure there's some image that comes to mind If we rewind in history all the way back to where the Israelite people, victory, a king coming, meant something so much different than what we see. You see, we get to read their story. We get to see their history. For them, they were living it. And so when they heard victory, it meant something different. They knew that God, and he was going to bring somebody. He was going to bring this ruler. He was going to bring someone to establish God's kingdom. And for them, it meant something completely different. And if you know Old Testament, if you know what was happening in history at that time, these people um, were in slavery, Like, that's what they did every day. They were in slavery. They were working for for Egypt. And so finally God does this thing, and he's like, set them free. And so he sets them free, and and they go, and you have like the Red Sea and the parting of the Red Sea and all that stuff, and then they're wandering in the desert. And God gives them this law, and we talked about this a little bit last week. God gives them this law that says, if you want to be made right with me, follow these laws. And so it was all about obedience, 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 following these things in the law. And you see it time and time again. And God gives them this. And then they start to go in battles. And God's giving them a land. And he says, if you go and fight these people, I'll give you victory. And so you see this thing. And God gives them all of this victory, all of this stuff, all of these battles that are happening. They have the law. They have their land. And they start asking for a king. They're like, we need someone to rule over us. We need a king. And God says, I'm your king. And they're like, no, oh, we really, like, we get this God, but we need someone down here. And so God gives them a king. And the people mess up. Something happens to them. And you see this whole Old Testament balance of, of the people asking for a king, um, repenting because they've done bad, um, God restoring them, and then somebody comes in and takes over them again and destroys them because they're, they're not acting how God says to act, and, and it's a cycle over and over again. And Zechariah says this in 9.9, the verse that we're kind of taking this whole thing. He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout and triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious and humble, riding on a donkey on a colt, on a foal. The Israelite people were thinking, man, here it comes. It's going to be this king again. 
And, and they heard what the prophets were saying, and they're like, it's going to be in David's line. And they're like, man, David was one of the best kings that we ever had. It's coming from his line. It's going to be great. They're going to come in here, and they're going to kick butt, and they're going to take names, and God's people are going to be uh, established again, and we're going to be this powerful kingdom. And so that's what they were thinking over and over again. It's going to be this sweet victory. And we know because we have the whole story that then you fast forward and and Jesus enters Jerusalem and he's riding on this donkey and people are praising him. It, It wasn't so that he could take over some earthly kingdom. His mission was different. It was to take over death itself. It was to conquer sin. Today I want to take you through a passage of scripture, and to do all of it would be a really long sermon, and I don't think most of you would stay with me during the whole thing. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, here's my challenge, read it sometime this week. There's like 58 verses in that chapter. Um, we're not going to go verse by verse all of it today, um, but I, I want to give you some highlights as we work through it. But sometime this week, read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because Paul's talking about how important the resurrection of Christ is to the Christian faith. How important just this concept of Jesus getting up from the grave. The cross is important. The resurrection is so important. Jesus dying for our sins, being that sacrificial lamb, is important. But if he would have never got up, Christianity would look completely different today. What makes Jesus different than every other religion that's out there is he got up. He got up. Paul starts by saying that he holds this message that he is preaching, that he he stands with it. That this message that he is sharing, that Paul is preaching to all these churches, to all these people, like he stands for what it says. What is that message? I'm glad you asked. Because look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. It says, For I've passed on to you, as most important what I've received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised On the third day, according to Scripture, Paul says that this is the most important thing. And still to this day, this is the most important thing that's in what we believe as Christians, what we believe as Christ followers. It takes Jesus. If you take Jesus out of this, there's nothing different about what we do here and now today than any other world religion that meets anywhere in this world. Jesus is that cornerstone. Jesus is that pen. Jesus is the reason that it changed literally everything. What Jesus did, he gave us access to God so that we could be made right with God, so that we can have victory with God. What did Jesus do? He died for our sins. He was put into a tomb, and he got up three days later. Elevation Worship just put out a new album last year, and there's a song on there. And, man, every time I start to think about this, I think about these words over and over. The silence of Saturday was broken with Sunday because he got up. He got up. He goes on to say, how many people saw Jesus after he rose? And actually, if you're reading through this, he's, he's making accounts of people that physically saw Jesus, physically had interactions with Jesus after he rose from the, from the dead. But let's keep reading, because in verse 12 through 14, it says this, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain. And so is your faith. Let me tell you a little bit what's happening in history. See, what was happening was in the, the Corinthian church... Outside things, outside forces, outside world was starting to creep into their theology. And one of the biggest things that was creeping in was this idea that you can't have a resurrection from the dead. 
Like it's not possible to rise from the dead. And so for the church, what they were doing was they were trying to, to live out their faith, but they were letting culture and society dictate what they believe instead of what Scripture should dictate. Man, if that's only would have ever happened right there in that Corinthian church, things would be great. It's the same things we deal with today. We've let society and culture dictate our theology instead of letting God dictate our theology. The Greeks at the time viewed bodily death as final. There's nothing after death. Paul says it's important to believe in the resurrection of dead because he says that in verse 13, he's like, if there's no resurrection... Of the dead, then not even Christ is raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, what in the heck are we doing here? We might as well pack up and go home. Actually, a few verses later, Paul says this in verse 17, and it's not on your screen. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. The whole New Testament means nothing. Everything we sing about today, everything we do, everything we pray is, is absolutely worthless if Christ didn't rise from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is essential. It's essential for our salvation. It's essential for our faith. It's essential for everything we believe as Christ followers. But Paul doesn't leave it there. In 1 Corinthians, verse 20, he says, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. Christ has victory. He has victory over sin. He has victory over death. Christ has been raised. He, he talks about this and he goes on to talk about Jesus, uh, the resurrection, and it secures us as followers of him. That we have victory because of Jesus' victory over death. And now because Jesus was raised from the dead, God has done something for him. Because Jesus has conquered sin, because Jesus has conquered death, God has done something for him. And it's the next verse in verse 27. It says, for God has put everything under his. For God has put everything under Jesus' feet. We talk about this all the time. It's the same message that Paul was saying in Ephesians. He's saying, there is nowhere where Jesus is not. There is nothing. Nothing that Jesus isn't over. There's nowhere Jesus isn't already at. There's no place. There's no time. There's no nothing. Jesus is everything. And everything in this world is now under Jesus' authority. He's under his feet. Like he has authority and domain over everything. You can't go to your crappy job tomorrow without Jesus already being there. Can't go home to maybe your messed up marriage or relationship where Jesus isn't already there. You can't go home to your perfect family or your idea of perfect family and house where Jesus isn't already there. He's over everything because God has placed everything under his feet. There's no place you can't go where Jesus isn't already there. He's even at your mother-in-law's house. <clears throat> I'm telling you. I might get in trouble for that one later. <clears throat> Paul goes on the next few verses to say why this is such a big deal. That why does it matter that Jesus, this whole Christianity thing, what difference does it make? Paul says if, if, if it's true, then if, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then you might as well eat, drink, and do whatever the heck you want. That's my interpretation of what Paul says, but that's what he said. Like, it, it doesn't matter. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, just go on living life because we're going to spend 60 to 80 to 90 years here on this earth and it's over.
If there is no Jesus, then enjoy everything this world has to offer. But good thing Paul doesn't stop there because in verse 33 he says, Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses. Stop sinning. Some of the, some of the other translations, instead of saying come to your senses, it says sober up. Stop sinning. For some people are ignorant about God. I say this to your shame. Paul's given this direct reflection of what he's been talking about in this whole passage. That bad company refers to people who are denying the resurrection. So what was Paul talking about in this? Because this verse gets used for a lot of different things in society and Scripture, but I want to tell you how Paul was using it so we understand the context of Scripture. Paul was saying that, that society... The world around the Greeks were influencing the church so much to actually take one of the cornerstones of their theology and start to throw it away. And Paul was saying, look, bad company corrupts good morals. If all you're going to do is hang out with those people, they're going to infect your life. They're going to corrupt you. When you constantly surround yourself or only surround yourself with people who do not believe like you do, they will always influence you in a way that pulls you away from Christ. And I'm not saying that we should completely isolate ourselves and move away and only be around Christian brothers and sisters. I'm not saying that. But we have to find this balance. Because everything that our world is preaching, everything that society is doing is, is pulling us away from what our cornerstone of our faith is. And Paul is saying, look, come to your senses. If that's what you're going to surround yourself with, that's what you're going to get. I always remember my dad saying, if you lay down with dogs, anybody remember the rest of that? You're going to get up with fleas? <laughs> or when I was a youth pastor for so many years, we, we like to think of missionary dating. <laughs> Do you know what missionary dating is? It's when they're not saved and you go to church and you're like, well, I'm going to date them because they're really hot and I'm going to make them come to church and then God will be all great and stuff. Bad company corrupts. Good morals. If you're never around unbelieving people, you'll never help people find, follow, and be transformed from Jesus. We have to find that balance. Paul ends 1 Corinthians 15 with one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I think I even used it a few weeks ago. But starting in the second part of verse 40, uh, 54, he says this, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, where death is your sting, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did the resurrection of Jesus conquer sin, it conquered death, it gives us Victory, And so when we look at this bottom line, when we look at this idea that Christ's victory assures our victory, we understand because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's essential to what we believe. It's essential to what we do here. I don't know for a lot of people... Having victory in our own life is tough. Sometimes we just don't feel very victorious. So how do we have victory that Jesus has claimed for us? How do we have victory in our life? And, and I struggle a little bit on this because if you've been around me, especially in this last year, I'm very trying so hard. I think our world has 
put some of this prosperity gospel that's in there that God just wants us to always have victory and that God just always wants us to be to be on top and that you're going to be rich and happy and and he's going to give you your wildest dreams and that's kind of creeped into the American church it hasn't kind of creeped into the American church it's in the American church it's that idea that if Paul was writing to to the American church today he would probably say bad company corrupts good morals that we've allowed worldly theology to trump biblical theology. And I want to be careful because when we talk about having victory, it could look a little different. But he gives us some keys in this last verse of 1 Corinthians 58 that I think can help us have victory in Christ. And he says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If you have your notes, you want to write some things down. Here's what you can write down. Here's the first one. Be faithful. Faithful is one of those words that I think has lost its meaning, especially in America. I think being faithful to stuff has kind of lost its, 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 its luster a little bit. It's one of those words that I think has, has diminished because a lot of people really aren't faithful anymore. I mean, we're kind of faithful to things. And, and we're kind of faithful to some, and some of us are. I mean, we, if good intentions is a great definition of being faithful, then maybe we, are, we are very faithful. Because I think for a lot of times we have the best intentions to do something, but we don't always have the best follow through. And so maybe that's a better definition of what we feel faithful is. It's good intentions. If hopefully we follow through. That's not a good definition of faithful. First Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast. Do this for me. Give, me. give me some words right now. You're going to interact with me a little bit, all right? So if you're sleeping, nudge the person beside you. You can wake up and, and interact a little bit. And, and if you're online, you can type it in the chats right now. Um, there is people that are watching it and looking over it and interacting with you. Um, um, we have eyes everywhere. Um, just kidding. But what's, your, what, what's something that comes to mind when you think of faithful? Like, just say it to me. Come on. Loyalty. Loyalty. All right. Honesty. Honesty. Someone says something over here. Yeah. I can't hear you. Come on now. Unseen. Unseen. Yeah. Commitment. All right. What else do you think of with faithful? I'd miss that one too. Trust. Is that what you said? All right. 100%. All right. Anything else? Come to mind, understanding, unconditional. One of the things I think of when I think of faithful is I think of, of remaining loyal. Remaining loyal. Eagle fans should, should know this term. And I get, I'm not trying to dog you. They, they just won a Super Bowl a few years ago. But now you, you're hanging on to something. You remain loyal. I was thinking, uh, man, it's probably not the best movie. That's all right. You can judge me later and then ask for forgiveness. Um, Major League. Remember that movie? Major League came out. It's funny. Remember, the, remember the like the three guys or the two? Was it two guys or three guys that just set up in the in the stands that like that's all they were? They were there like every they they were horrible and they're just up there cheering them on. Like, they're loyal. They're faithful in the good and the bad. My boys got beat by a number 15 seeded basketball team, and I understand they're supposed to be a Christian university, but it hurts. But it doesn't matter. I'm still faithful to them. I wore my Ohio State shirt yesterday and was faithful. Like, this idea of being loyal. When it comes to your faith, Are you just as faithful? When life 
gets really rough, are you still faithful? When God doesn't come through how you think God should have came through, are you still faithful? See, we want the victory, but we're not always that faithful. I know you're like, Pastor Tony, you don't understand what I'm going through. Maybe I don't. Here's the truth I know, and it might sting a little. Victims never have victory. Victims never have victory. We serve a God who is victorious. And I'm tired of seeing Christians live as the victim when our Savior has given us victory. And when we're faithful, He will be faithful. Here's the second one. Be secure. Be secure. Where's that safe place you go? Or that safe thing you go to? Who's that person that you feel most secure about? All of us have places. All of us have things. All of us have people that help us be secure. That we feel safe around. My question is, are you secure in Christ? Uh, 1 Corinthians 58 again, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be faithful, be immovable, be secure. When we're secure, when we're insecure, it brings out the worst in us, right? When we're insecure about something, it usually brings out the worst of us. And usually it's fear that drives our insecurities. We're afraid of something. Fear makes us do dumb things. Fear makes us say dumb things. Fear makes us act in dumb ways. Fear brings out, and I think insecurity is rooted in fear. Our enemy will always build insecurities and doubts in your mind. I'm not good enough. Like, like I, I don't have the intelligence to, to do this. I, I'm, not, I'm not a smart person. And all these insecurities that we have start to breed into our life. Not strong enough. The list can go on and on and on. And all of these are in complete contrast to what God says about you, what Jesus says about you. You see, and our enemy wants us to live in insecurity, and God's saying, no, there's security found in me. Mind, the world around you will always make you believe that you're something you're not. And it's God who gives us victory. And when we buy into all of this, it leaves us in a place where we aren't living in, a vi in the victory of what Jesus did. We're not living in the power of the resurrected Christ because of what Jesus did. We now have security. And what he calls you is way different than what anybody else might call you. God calls me a son, or he calls you a son or a daughter. Do you realize your God calls you a masterpiece? That you're divine. That you're an heir. Because Jesus had victory, we can be secure and have victory. The last thing he says is be active. I was thinking about this. COVID's done a lot of things for two people. Or, or There's two types of people that kind of happened with COVID. Those who became really active, I saw them. They like I saw people walking around our neighborhood I'd never seen in my entire life. And then those of us who decided to, to take COVID by adding pounds to our body <laughs> and became inactive. It's all right, I'm with you, I'm trying to figure that out. 
But he says this in 1 Corinthians, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast and movable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labors in the Lord is not in vain. I was thinking about this. The Lord's work, what is that? And, and I feel like it can be defined in a few different ways. I think that, that when you serve your community or you serve the world around you, it's doing the Lord's work. I think we have some missionaries, and God calls some people to go and serve overseas and do some amazing things, and I think that's doing the Lord's work. I think sometimes he calls people to be pastors, or he calls them to, to work with children, or, or be executive pastors, and, and, or worship pastors, or all these different things, and I think that's doing the Lord's work. But I also think sometimes he calls you into a workforce to do his work there. Like I said earlier, if Jesus is already everywhere, it's not like we're taking him to some place. He's already at your job. Maybe he's placed you there to do his work to illuminate Jesus that's already there. So God has called us, and I think that's doing his work. I think the conversations that we have when we're sitting on the sidelines at sporting events watching our kids can be doing the Lord's work. I think discipling someone or mentoring somebody is doing the Lord's work. I think serving here at church and helping like with, with whether it's the nursery or helping with, with maybe it's, it's, it's our online stuff that we do. I think that's doing the Lord's work. It might be in the sound or, or all this other stuff that goes on. I think that's doing the Lord's work that God has asked us to do. I think showing others who Jesus is is doing the Lord's work. And if you're not doing any of these things, I was trying to figure out a term for it. And all I kept thinking about is what we used to call the kids that walked around holding their skateboard and never riding it. They're just a poser. If all you're doing is checking off your Sunday box, you're not being active. I, I struggle. I don't understand how the church can be full of people, and yet we struggle so much for people to step up and serve and help. And I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm really not. I'm just trying to show you what the Bible says. And, and Paul's saying, be active. Continue to do the Lord's work. We need help, whether it's serving here or serving at an egg hunt. If you need help trying to figure out how you bring God to your workplace, tell us. We'll help you out. But we need to be active in doing the Lord's work. I keep saying this, but it's something that's just resonating with me. I think for a lot of people who claim Christ, we want the benefits of Christ without the responsibilities of Christ. Being active isn't just showing up. Some of us not, might not be having the victory right now because we're not active in our faith. Christ's victory assures our victory. I want to say this, and I hope you hear me today. I love you guys. I really do. If you're watching online, I love you. I want the best for you. And I know as things have been changing and shifting in our culture and in America, I know God's been stirring with me that how the church needs to shift and change and some things need to be different. Ask questions. Are you faithful? Are you secure in who Christ is? Are you active in your faith doing what God has called you to do? 
Because if you are, I think we can have victory, Christ's victory. And if not, it might hurt. It might just be a poser. You can carry your Bible, but you never actually open it. Our world desperately needs to know Jesus. Our world desperately needs church, Christ following people to be different than what they are. Our church needs people to be faithful because our world needs the victory that our Savior gave us through the resurrection. Our world needs Christ followers who are faithful, who are secure, who are active because we do this Lord's work not in vain. It's nothing new. Christ looked over his people and saw all the hurt that he needed. He said, as the scripture says, he had compassion. And he's like, man, there's so much to be done. If I only had people to help. We can have victory. You can have victory because of what Christ has done. But I believe that it comes with us being faithful, being secure, and being active. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for everything you do. God, I thank you for the victory that we have through the resurrection of your son, Jesus. That God, we can be victorious today. And God, I pray as we move from this place today, that God, you would convict us. If we're not being as faithful as we should be, God, help us to become more faithful. God, if we're not as secure in who we are in you, God, help us be secure today. And God, if we're not active in doing your work, then God, move us to be active. God, I don't want to be a poser. I don't want to just try to carry the name of Christ and get the benefits of Christ without actually doing anything for Christ. God, I don't want to be a part of a church that acts that way either. So God, move us, spur us on. Lead us, God, and we can too have victory because your son had victory for us. It's in your name we pray these things, amen.